Rob Doster here. I got Jeff Goodman with me. Hell no. John Fink. Are we still live? Kill the 68 till I die. Get it to I'm sorry, man. I blacked out. Randolph Children. DJ Khaled. You know the big DJ Khaled guy? Hands grow up and in. Goodman needs to be fired all the time. Josh Pastor. You're going to beat people straight up. You know the deal. Drink responsibly tonight. I'll be drinking with you. Jarrell McNeil. From the bluest of the blue bloods to the smallest of the mid majors. This is Field the 68. After dark. Hello and welcome to the Thursday evening edition of the Field of 68 After Dark. We are live here streaming on YouTube. We are live on Stadium. We are live over on the Stadium YouTube channel. Make sure you guys hang out tonight after the show is done. Head on over. We're going to be answering your questions. Our show last call every night at midnight over on Stadium. We will be there tonight again. Uh, things have gotten a little weird in the uh, in the chat and the questions that we get. Um, uh, Coach Matt can attest to that. Uh, he's he's uh, talked with Tyler Hansborough about fighting bears, about fighting all different kinds of animals. So we'll see what happens there. Make sure you show up with us. Uh, we're going to get into a full preview of all of the games that are happening this week, and especially number nine against number one, Illinois at Purdue, a battle for supremacy in the Big Ten. Does Illinois actually have a chance in that game? We will answer it. And I do want to hit these guys on the uh, the looming drama between Rick Pitino and Dan Hurley and everything that is happening there between those two. But before we do, two teams seem like they are back. Arizona right now, after having lost three out of five, is currently up 60 to 32 with 13 minutes left on Colorado. Colorado's missing their top two players, but this is a beatdown. Before we get to that, Michigan State. They started the season out four and five. Since then, they have gotten hot. They have been one of the best offensive teams in college basketball over the course of the last five games where they've blown out Baylor, they've blown out Oakland, they've blown out Stony Brook. They had a uh, a close win that ended up being a 12-point margin against Indiana State. And tonight, Matt McCall, they blew out Penn State in the Breslin Center. Are you all in? Are the Spartans back? I was never off. And you guys kept trying to give me, hit the panic button, hit the panic button. We got to hit the panic button. The Spartans, you know, Coach Izzo, man, they're just not the right team. With five teams, they've lost some games early. You got to hit the panic button. I never hit the panic button. Okay, you, Henson, a lot of other people were trying to hit that panic button. You don't hit the panic button when Tom Izzo is your head coach. He's done this before. His teams always seem to grow, get better. It doesn't matter where they're picked to start the season off. They could drop some games, and they could end up in the Final Four. I, I, I never was off the ship in terms of Michigan State. I think they're a really good team. Their coach is a Hall of Fame coach. has won a million games. It's one of the best to ever do it in all of college basketball. Tyson Walker continues to play at a high, high level, and you know we knew how good he was, and he play, he's played at a high level all year. It was who else is going to step up? Who's going to help him? Who's going to rise to the occasion to give them another punch? And now they're getting that. They're getting more balance on offense. I think some of their struggles early on in the season was their execution on offense. I mean, I've said it on the show before. Coach Izzo's teams, even especially after timeouts, side out of bounds, underneath out of bounds, they've been so good in those types of situations. They were struggling early on in the year. I don't think they were playing playing with a good enough pace either and Tyson Walker was still doing his deal now they're back to that and look I never hit that panic button Rob never not once I'm still all (laughs) in on those parties you know I never hit the panic button but uh you know I wasn't necessarily the biggest believer right before they played Baylor I mean I kept saying and we kept talking about it Rob that like hey they're gonna come around they're gonna come around and, and they just they just didn't. I didn't feel like they had any type of interior threat into any type of interior scoring. Their uh, their rebounding margin wasn't the one that uh, you'd normally see out of a Spartan team. And um, you know, I, I know that they they you know have won some home games in a row. Uh, I'm not maybe willing to go as far as McCall, but again, Tom Izzo, his teams always get better. That that's the one thing that always sticks out to me about Michigan State is his teams continue to get better. It didn't look like it through November and December, but here over the last week or two, um, man, the beatdown of Baylor, obviously a beatdown tonight. Penn State's nowhere near the type of team that Baylor is, but at the same time, I think Indiana State's a really good team. 
And uh, although it was close the majority of the game, I think that's more credit to Indiana State than it is to Michigan State's uh, early season woes. Uh, I, I think they're back. I don't know if they're uh, top three in the Big Ten. I'm not sure I'd go that far, but I wouldn't put it past them at the same time. Yeah, yeah the, and I'll just it, I'll just jump in, Rob, real quick too. Like to to back up Coach's point, when they lost to Wisconsin at home, and that was the first league game of the season, and they got beat by 13. And I think Wisconsin, I, I still think they're a really good team. You know, you read the notes, you read the game notes, what they're doing. I mean, they had guys that were sick. They were were they even going to play? Malik Hall, who who's in the lineup? Who's out of the lineup? Are they healthy? Are they full? And like Coach just said, that coaches, those teams just always find a way to get better. And I think they're past some of those injuries. They're obviously past the whole team having the flu, and they're, they've hit their stride. And, you know, Penn State has obviously had their struggles. But, you know, like Coach said, the beat down of Baylor, that was kind of like, okay, not, now they're, mm-hmm. they're getting healthy again, and they're, they're finding their way. Is it too simplistic? to simply say that they are actually making the open shots that they were getting through the first month of the season. If you look at this five-game winning streak, I did the math. The math might be wrong. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I'm a math savant. But according to my calculations, they're 45 for 102 in the five games on the, this winning streak that they're on. And if Google has not lied to me, that is a 44.1% three-point shooting clip over the course of the last five games where they've scored 89, 79, 99, 87, and 92 points, right? Before that, uh, they they kind of famously started the season two for 31 from beyond the arc. There was a point in time when they were shooting about 22% from three. Is it, is it Mac, is that too simple to say? Like the shots are just going down? Is it just like a team confidence thing? They saw a couple go in. You go 8 for 12 against Baylor. You run a top five team out of the gym in Detroit, and now all of a sudden the confidence is flowing? I mean, it's, it's, it, it helps, obviously, but at the same time, I also think, <laughs> what, what type of quality shots are you getting? You know, and, and I think that, you know, when you get better shots for your team, for the players on your team, you know, regardless of the result, I know everybody wants to look at the result. You talked about, you know, plus 40%. But when you get better shots for your team, generally teams defensively are in rotation. Teams are flying out to challenge you late, albeit. It gives you an opportunity to be a better offensive rebounding glass. Everything offensively, to me, uh, ties into, you know, how well, how, you know, the, the type of shots that you're producing. How well are, are you getting those? How open are you getting your shooters? And, um, you know, even if you miss those shots, Rob, you get an opportunity to rebound them. So, like, I don't get married or tied to so much the percentage, although we always want to <laughs> – coach a team that makes their shots I get I get married to the fact that like you're getting better shots and now now you have have an opportunity as Michigan State always does to offensive rebound at a really high level and so I feel like they're moving the ball a little bit better again Tom Izzo's teams are predicated on execution they run a thousand set plays any coach that's ever gone against you gone against him will tell you that and um You know, they're executing better. They're getting better looks. And now they're getting to the offensive boards as well. It all goes hand in hand, in my opinion. Yeah. McCall? Yeah, and I think playing with better pace, too, you know, to to Coach's point, you know, what were the shots that they were generating early on in the season? I think when you saw them play some, uh, you know, everyone, every coach, it's amazing when you you watch a coach's press conference when he gets a job. It's like, I want to play fast. I want to play fast. I never really liked that. I, I think playing with pace is a better term to say because when you start saying playing fast, it becomes chaotic. But when you talk about playing with pace, it's not only where where are we – where's the shot clock at when we're initiating our first pick and roll or initiating our set or whatever we're doing. When the ball's across half court, where's the shot clock at, right? Is it at 22 or is it at 28? That means we're playing with good pace. How hard are we cutting? How hard are we screening? those types of things. And I think they're playing with much better pace at this point in the year. And I think that's another reason that they're shooting a higher percentage from the three point line. But to coach's point as well, I mean, it's, look, as a coach, you're never going to complain when the ball is going in from behind a three point line. Cause that, that definitely helps. <laughs> that, that's greatest. Yeah, two for 31 is not gonna cut it. 
Yeah. Oh. Two for 31 is not going to cut it. 44% from beyond the arc, and you're getting yourself a nice fat extension. Uh, another team that has kind of put some things together here is Arizona. It is uh, still a 30 point lead for the Wildcats. There are now nine minutes left in that game. I just, well, we might as well just talk about them right now because Colorado was not making a comeback here. Arizona coming into this game had lost three of their last five. They gave up 92 points against Purdue in what was effectively a road game. They gave up 96 points, albeit in double overtime, in a loss to Florida Atlantic uh, in what was effectively a home game. And then they gave up 100 to Stanford on a road game on New Year's Eve. Uh, 36 points in 31 minutes right now for Colorado. It seems like the message that uh, that Tommy Lloyd maybe put out, McCall, was uh, was heard by this team. Yeah, I, I mean, look, I think they're really good. I, I think when you look at, you know, their league too, and especially tonight in Colorado's undermanned, I mean, we got to, you know, put that out there because I thought that Colorado was really the one team that could push Arizona in the league, and we didn't get to see them at full strength tonight. Um, I'm not going to throw out my winning is hard line because I don't want to get a text during the middle of this show from Jeff Goodman that McCall always says that winning is hard, which it is hard, but I'm not going to throw that out there. But, you know, I, I mean, when you look at, you know, who they've beaten, who they've played, and, you know, even their losses. I mean, they lost to Purdue, who could win a national championship, and I think they're the clear-cut number one team in the country. They lose in Vegas to FAU, who I know FAU has lost a couple games that nobody expected them to lose, but they're still a really, really good team. And I think the Stanford one was a little bit surprising, giving up as many points as they did. But, you know, you're still growing, you're learning, you're figuring out your team, and now it's January. And what's our identity? Who are we going to be? How are we going to play as we get into league play? And understanding, too, look, I don't care where we're playing or who we're playing against across their jersey or what their record is. It's conference play. And everybody seems to raise their level once you get into league play. So you want to say we're going on the road and we're playing against Stanford, we're going to be okay. That's how you get beat. And you still have a young head coach in Tommy Lloyd that's figuring things out too on who he is as a head coach, even with all his experiences at Gonzaga. It's going through some of these things, but understanding it, it doesn't matter. I don't care what Stanford's record is. They're, they're fully capable of beating us if we don't show up in between these lines and play to our standard, but I, you know, I, I still think that they're a final four caliber team. And I, I just don't know who, yeah, you know what, McCall, I want to, I want to go back to one thing real quick that you mentioned on, uh, you, you said, I don't want to say winning is hard. I think that the, this is actually where it, it makes a lot of sense to, to, to have into the conversation, right? You play Purdue in Indianapolis and you lose uh, what was a, like a close game, right? You lost by eight points uh, on, on a, road atmosphere against the best team in college basketball. Then you go out and double overtime and you lose because Nellie Davis has a career game and goes absolutely bonkers against a team that's coming off of a run to the final four. And then you go on the road on New Year's Eve. Yeah. And and you're going on the road to Stanford, Mac. It's the second game of a road trip. It is New Year's Eve. You have a bunch of kids on that roster that are probably thinking, okay, we're going to smack this 6-7 and seven team, and we're going to go home, and we're going to go back to Tucson where we're going to have an unbelievable New Year's Eve party, right? Like, I, I think all three of those losses, you can kind of look at it and say, yeah, I get why those happened. Yeah, I mean, but if you're, uh, you know, if you're the coach of that, that team, you're not really excited <laughs> about uh, taking the L, you know. It happens, man. You know, it, it happens. Understand that Arizona's had such an incredible tradition uh, for so long that when they show up to Stanford, Stanford's excited to play. I mean, that's that's a, an opportunity to get a quad one win, a feather in their cap, you know, maybe start turning things uh, for the better as they start Pac-12 play. So, uh, you know, Tommy's going to have, you know, you're going to have ups and downs, especially when you have some young players. And, again, I know Caleb's obviously a, a very experienced player, but Kylan Boswell's young and, and uh, again, their togetherness is young. Arizona's going to be fine in the long run. And sometimes games like that, although stinks in the, in the short term, a lot of times they're good for your team. You know, you're going to play other games where, you know, you probably would possibly overlook the, the opponent. But hopefully you have a reminder now that you can't do that as they found out in Palo Alto. 
Yeah, sometimes a wake-up call is a uh, is a good thing. Listen, we're going to take a break. When we get back, we're going to go through the best games of the weekend, highlighted by the showdown of the big town, Illinois at Purdue. I'm going to make these guys make their picks. What's going on, guys? Before we get back to the show, I need to let you all know about the Field of 68 Daily, an all-encompassing college basketball newsletter that arrives in your inbox, you guessed it, daily. For less than a dollar a week, you'll wake up every morning to more than 1,500 words detailing everything that you need to know to stay up to date on the world of college basketball. From the notable mid-major upsets to the stars that are out injured to the breakout performances that only our team of college basketball junkies watched. The Daily is edited and produced by Mike Miller, who spent more than two decades running NBC's digital written content and is subscribed by more than half of the Division One coaching staffs, the biggest names in college basketball media, and the agents that work as power brokers in the sport. For just $50 for the year, you get access to the same information that the insiders get. And before we get you back to your regularly scheduled Field of 68 content, let me tell you guys about the Field of 68 merch store. Head over to fieldof68.shop for officially branded Field of 68 apparel. Whether you're supporting your favorite team in the student section or from the couch, there is no better way to gear up and the latest from the Field of 68. The best thing I can say about our merch is the quality of the product. Anyone that has ever worn a t-shirt knows how frustrating it is when the neck gets all stretched out and the bottom of the shirt starts looking like the bottom of bell-bottom jeans. And there's nothing worse than a hoodie that loses its snugness that makes it such a perfect way to stay warm during the cold winter weather. Whether you're shopping for yourself or for the college basketball fan in your life, everything you need is at the Field of 68.shop. Welcome back to the Thursday evening edition of the Field of 68 After Dark. I'm Rob Dawson. So we got Chris Mack. We got Matt McCall. We're going to be joined by Colorado State head coach Nico Medved here in about 20 minutes coming up in the next segment. Uh, but before we do, we got to get into the games from this weekend. We are going to start Illinois at Purdue. The line right now over, according to our friends at BetMGM, is Purdue minus 9.5. The total there is 155.5. And, and I do just want to mention Vaulted here, guys. Vaulted is an app that allows you to participate in daily cash prize pools without an entry fee. It is a place you can store your predictions forever. And by using the challenge feature, you can prove you're smarter than your friends. Friends. Download the app. That's V L T E D to challenge your friends, store your predictions, and join daily cash prize pools without an entry fee. My challenge to you guys: I have Illinois covering the nine and a half points here. McCall, we're going to you first. How do you see this one playing out? I mean, nine and a half is a lot of points. Uh, you know, I I'm taking Purdue to win the game, um, but I think the can Illinois cover the point spread, especially at home. Uh, I think so. Uh, we'll see what, if the spread continues to stay at nine and a half. But I think Purdue's too good. I think, uh, you know, and they'll be up for this game. I, I think the crowd in there will be absolutely outstanding. Um, I just don't see them them dropping this game. I think Coach Painter has them playing at a high, high level. I think the guards have continued to grow up. I think Zach Eady continues to play as the best player in the country. So, Man, I gotta I gotta stick with the boilermakers on this one. Yeah, um, I I tend to agree that Purdue will win this. I do like Illinois to cover the spread. I do like them to cover the nine and a half. The number you see right up there, Purdue minus eight, is uh the projection that is on Ken Palm. So Ken Palm um would tend to lean uh towards uh, being on Purdue here. Um, I don't know, or I'm sorry, the, would tend to lean towards being on Illinois here. So I tend to lean towards what Ken Palm does. I just think that the ability of, uh, of, of, um, oh, I'm, uh, who, why am I blanking? Uh, Marcus Dom, um, Marcus Domas oh to kind of take people one on one is going to be something that will be difficult for some of the smaller guards of Purdue to deal with. Mac, what do you have? I think number one, you know, playing at Purdue, that place is going to be rocking. You know, let's get that straight. It's going to be rocking. Students will be back. Um, yeah, you know, when, when Terrence Shannon went out, you know, I liken it to uh, the year that we had the kid Edmund Sumner. Obviously, different circumstances. Edmund went uh, up against St. John's. MSG blows out his knee. And we come home a completely different team, you know, which, again, I know Illinois is talented, but they're a different team without Terrence Shannon. It doesn't mean they're worse or anything. It just means they're different. And that's what happened for us. We got all excited and, hey, you know, we bonded together and we played Seton Hall and, and we crushed them just like Illinois did against Northwestern. 
you know, the other night without him. But as time went on, the reality of losing a great player uh, like Edmund really sort of took its toll, and we lost several in a row before we really rebounded. And I, I can see the same thing sort of happening with Illinois. And I really like their team, but I do think they're different without Terrence Shannon. I don't think they have anybody that can ha handle Zach Eady inside, not that anybody really does. Uh, he's a foregone, in my mind, you know, national player of the year. Um, I just think if Purdue's playing, and they will be uh, in West Lafayette with the students behind them, that's going to be a tall task. I do think that Illinois will keep it closer to nine and a half, though. Yeah, so Mac is on the – we're all on the same page. Purdue's going to win, but Illinois will cover that spread, which means you probably want to hammer to Purdue laying the nine and a half if all three of us are on the same side here. All right, let's get into some of these <laughs> other games. Big one in the ACC, North Carolina at Clemson. The Kempom projection there is Clemson minus one. McCall, can Tar Heels get it done? Is is To tuned in right now? We got to. Yes. I mean, I don't. I don't want to upset you know my man To. Is T I know he's dialed in. No, I'm. I'm taking the Tigers. I, I, I like the Tigers in this one. Uh, I'm gonna roll with our guy with his alma. Um, I know they've they, they've had a tough one, you know, lately. But I, I, look, man, I think they're a really good team. You know. Coach has done an unbelievable job. He's been on Goodman's hot seat. I can't tell you how many freaking times every year that this guy's been on, on Goodman's hot seat and Brad Burnell, but um, he's got his team playing at a high level, and I like his team, and I'm, I'm going to roll with the Tigers on this one. Yeah, I'm rolling with the Tigers as well. Uh, they – Lost at Miami and they lost at Memphis. Those are two teams that are going to be tournament teams, two teams that uh, I think have a chance to be able to play in the second weekend of the NCAA tournament. And you're playing on the road in those games. It is what it is. The road is a difficult place. Winning is hard, McCall. Winning is hard. It's a little less hard when you're doing it at home. Give me P.J. Hall, national play, uh, first team All-American P.J. Hall, ACC Player of the Year P.J. Hall. The Tigers win this one. Mac, what do you got? It's going to be a great game. I mean, both teams have superior big guys, some of the best big guys in the league. I think that, you know, Clemson coming off that tough loss at Miami, um, you know, I think they're going to have the opportunity to play, a, you know, top 15, top 20 team in Carolina and, and get it done. So I'm going with the Clemson Tigers. I've been on their bandwagon for a while, and I'm, I'm not jumping off just yet. Next up, Kentucky at Matt McCall's Florida Gators right now. Ken Palm is projecting Kentucky as a one-point favorite. Can Florida pull off the upset, Matt? So let me preface this. I was traveling this morning from, <laughs> from Florida to New York, and I got the text message to pick these games. And I think I jumped the gun a little bit too quick because I think Kentucky's really, really good. My problem with this is this used to be a rivalry. And this is the first game of the SEC season is Florida-Kentucky. That was never the case back in the day. This was the last game of the regular season. Now, Kentucky has won 9 out of 10. But I was on the bench for 11 years of this rivalry, and it was a rival. I want to go back to when Joe Kim Noah was swi swiping the – pom-pom out of the girl's hand in Rupp Arena or when Jay Will went up there and lit up. So my gut instinct when I first saw the game was to say Kentucky's winning this game because I think Kentucky's really, really good. And I think Cal's got him playing at a high level. He's got veterans in Trey Mitchell. He's got great guards. I love Reed Shepard. But I'm not going against the Gators. And I know we can't change the graphic <laughs> down here because the graphic may have been on that – 6 a.m. flight this morning when I was being a little bit not too dialed in. But I'm more frustrated with the fact that this is the first SEC game of the season. If I'm Todd Golden, I'm showing clips of the rivalry. We got to get it back to being a rivalry. Give me the Gators in the exact tech arena, <laughs> which it used to be called the House of Horrors back in the day. But let's the go. The O-Dome. You don't walk in the O-Dome and get wins. I can't, I can't right, 11 Paul? years on the bench, but we need this to be a rivalry again because it hasn't been a rivalry. It's I just see Gagan right now going like this, rubbing his gotta face. Get, you got to get it back to a rivalry. Doing? Come on, give me it. <laughs> so – uh, yeah, I have Kentucky winning this game. Um, I, I just think that their guards are going to be too good. Uh, and it, it just, it's, it's going to be a statement game for them. It's the start of SEC play. I think they're going to come out strong. Mac, 
Who you got? This, this is all about to me how the uh, the young kids handle the environment. You know, because I I feel like they have a superior team. I feel like they have superior players. I think they're playing at a very high level, but this is going to be one of the first environments that's not a neutral site type of environment. You know, it's going to be, uh, you know, green and orange pom-poms and, and, and <laughs> the place is going to be rocking for the Wildcats. So those guys are going to have to, they're going to have to be consistent. They're going to have to handle the environment. They're going to have to be able to like be ready on minute one. So they don't get behind 10 to two and then start playing differently than they've played all year. But I, Kentucky's one of my favorite teams in the country. I've been saying that from the very beginning. And, uh, you know, talent-wise, I think the freshmen are really starting to to mature. Uh, so I'm taking the Wildcats. Yeah, so that uh, it looks like a sweep up there. It is not a sweep. Matt McCall did not go against his alma mater. He did not go against the Gators. Chomp, chomp. Uh, all right, Rick Pitino, St. John's, going on the road at Villanova. Can Kyle Neptune take down one of the best to ever do it, McCall. I, I just I'm, – I'm taking experience over inexperience in this one, and that's why I'm taking Coach Patino. Um, you know, I, I watched them the other night in, in their win against Butler. I'm still trying to figure out why Thad Mata got thrown out of that game. I was kind of confused when that happened, but I, I'm, I'm taking the experience of Coach Patino. I, I, you know, I like the way his team is playing. I thought they looked great the other night against Butler. So um, give me coach and the Johnnies in this one. Yeah, give me the Johnnies as well. They're going to get up underneath uh, Villanova and, and play that like that 2-2-1 two, two, press that that he loves to play. And I just think it's going to give uh, fits to uh, Villanova's offense. Give me the Johnnies. Give me the money line. Whatever it is, I am taking it. Mac. Villanova six-point favorites, huh, by Ken Palm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't see that. You know, I think Villanova, number one, needs Justin Moore back, and he needs him back quickly. I know they beat Xavier the other night, but, you know, one of the things that sort of is apparent when I watch Villanova is they miss a lot of open threes. They never used to. I mean, they never used to. And, you know, I think that, uh, you know, obviously Eric Dixon's a matchup problem, but I think that, you know, St. John's and Coach Patino are going to run that matchup zone. They're going to keep Soriano right under the basket and not have to worry about guarding Dixon with him. And uh, they need a guy like Armstrong to start making threes. They have several guys shooting 30% or below, which is un Villanova like. And so I'm going to go with St. John's on the road uh, against the Wildcats. It's a sweep. The Johnnies, Rick Patino. All right, let's get through these. We got four games left and about two minutes to knock them all out. McCall, Providence at Creighton. Providence, their first game without Bryce Hopkins. Can they go into Omaha and get the win? I don't think so. Not without Bryce Hopkins. Not not on the road. It'll be a great environment in, at Creighton. So I'm taking the Blue Jays in this one. Uh, yeah, I'm going with the Blue Jays as well. I wanted to be on the Providence bandwagon, but not having Bryce is going to be a major difference maker. Uh, that was a pretty brutal scene to see. So my thoughts are out to uh, to Bryce Hopkins and uh, his family. It was uh, that was a rough watch. McCall, or I'm sorry, Mac. Who do you have? It's tough, man. I feel I feel for Bryce. I've known him and his family. Uh, he committed to us at one point, and so um, and that's going to be a big blow to Providence. And, and then you know you look at the big picture, their team without him. I mean. They're coming off a home loss and, you know, Big East basketball. Now they go on the road to Creighton, uh, not kind. And so I, I'm going with the Creighton Blue Jays uh, as well, just like you guys. All right. Auburn at Arkansas. We got Bruce Pearl. We got Eric Musselman. We have two of the most energetic coaches that you're going to find. But call, can the Tigers go into Bud Walton and pick up a W? I'm a big fan of Coach Pearl in terms of who he is as a coach, man. That guy is – hes we scrimmaged when I was at Chattanooga. His teams, they, they always beat us when he was at Tennessee, when we were at Florida, even when we had those national championship teams. But I'm not i am not going against the must bus in this one. Not at home. He finds a way to win 30 games every year. Uh, you know, maybe he'll keep his shirt on after this one. But uh, <laughs> I, got to, I, got to, I'm, I got him calling Pig Suey. Um, in Bud Walton on Saturday. Well, listen, we have a we have a shirt in our merch store that says "My coach takes his shirt off." So if Arkansas does win, I hope that Must takes his shirt off so I can sell some T-shirts. But I don't think it's going to be that. I think Auburn's going to go in there and get the W. I think that after this game on Saturday, Mac, we are going to be saying, 
hey, you know what? Auburn might be as good as Kentucky. They might be a team that can win the SEC. That's the conversation we're going to have about the Auburn Tigers after this game. Am I right? Am I wrong? Where you at, Mac? You know Split what? I, here. I, I've, sort of, I've sort of had a Matt McCall moment a little bit. Like I picked Auburn, and I'm not coming off the pick. I'm going to stay with it. But <laughs> I get a little concerned with Auburn going on the road to to Arkansas. The only – road game that Auburn has played thus far is at App State and they took an L and it's going to be a little different environment in Fayetteville <laughs> for the Auburn Tigers. <laughs> hey, I would not be surprised if Arkansas pulls it off but uh, I'm going to I'm going to stick with my pick. I'm not going to be McCall and play both sides of it. I'm going to go with the Auburn Tigers. All right, guys, we got one minute left. So quick, McCall, we have Miami at Wake Forest. Miami coming off of a win over Clemson. Wake Forest has won eight in a row. Who you got? Give me my man Forbes. Give me Wake Forbes, Forbes. baby. I got Forbes, too. I got Forbes, too. Mac, what do you got? I'm going to give Forbes a little bit of uh, incentive, give him a little motivation. I'm going to take the Miami Hurricanes with Nigel <laughs> Pack and see if they get Google Poplar back. Nigel Pack, the $400,000 life wallet man. Last thing we got, Chris Beard. Ole Miss at Tennessee. Ole Miss still undefeated. One of three undefeated teams left in the country. Are we going to be saying that after this game on Saturday, McCall? Nope, not because of – it's going to be because of Dalton Connect. Give me the volunteers. That's hard for a Gator alum to pick the volunteers. But Dalton <laughs> Connect, I think he's one of the best players in the SEC. Give me the balls at home. I can't believe that you tried to come in here picking Kentucky to beat Florida and Tennessee to win a basketball game. What are you doing, McCall? You got to get back to your roots, man. You've spent too much time in that dungeon up there in Long Island. Uh, I have Tennessee winning this game as well. Um, I think that Ole Miss will cover if it ends up being a 13 point, point spread. That is something that I will be very, very, very interested in opening up the Bet MG, MGM app and betting on. Uh, Mac. Who do you have? So it shows their strength of schedule. The fact that an undefeated team is 13-point underdogs going into the weekend so or, or going into tomorrow. I'm going with the Tennessee Volunteers as well. Well, listen, uh, we are all on the same page here, which means you need to hammer Ole Miss, um, and you will find yourself winning that game. On the other side of the break, we're going to be hearing from Colorado State head coach Nico Medved and one of the top teams in college basketball. As you guys know by now, we've partnered with BetMGM Sportsbook for this college basketball season. We're going to be using BetMGM lines to make all of our picks and predictions throughout the college basketball season. And we are going to have special offers for you, the listeners and the viewers on the field of 68, each and every week during the season. If you haven't signed up with BetMGM yet, use the bonus code FIELD1500 and you will get up to a $1,500 first bet offer on your first wager on BetMGM Sportsbook. Here's what you got to do. Download the BetMGM app. Sign up using the bonus code FIELD1500. Deposit at least $10 and place your first wager on any game. You will receive up to $1,500 in bonus bets if that bet loses. Just make sure you use the bonus code FIELD1500 when you sign up. And remember, BetMGM is now available under one wallet in select states. As a New Jersey resident, this is super convenient for me when I have to go cover games in New York or Philly. When across the state borders, just log into your existing account instead of having to create new accounts in each state that you go to. And most importantly, I got to let you know, we do have some fun stuff coming up for this college basketball season. Bet insurance tokens, college hoops odds boosts, my personal favorite, Parlay odds boosts. So download the Bet MGM app today. Welcome back to the field of 68 After Dark. And that guy you see on the screen there, we have an extra face. It's Nico Medved, Colorado State head coach. I got Matt McCall with me. I got Chris Mack with me. My name is Rob Doster, but the star of the segment is the head coach of the number 13 team in America, the Colorado State Rams, coming off of a win over uh, Matt McCall's Final Four team, the New Mexico Lobos. We'll talk about that in a little bit. <laughs> coach, I got to ask you this. Uh, you have you have Isaiah Stevens on your roster. So we're you're sitting here at 13-1 and one on the season. Isaiah Stevens is the first team All-American for me. How much of this is you and how much of this is just, uh, you know what, I'm going to give the ball to my All-American and let him rock. 
hey, these guys will tell you, I don't need to answer that. It's all him, man. There, there has never been uh, a, a great coach without great players. And he is an, just an exceptional leader and player. And so I just kind of try to stay out of his way and it makes me look smart. Mm-hmm. It's so much fun to watch him operate when you put him in ball screens and let him kind of space the floor. Um, how much uh, have you changed what you do to kind of cater to the skill set of the player that you have? I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, listen, it's always about players, not plays. I mean, we have a, a system, a way we like to play that that's really evolved. But, you know, ultimately, when you look at every team and every year, you, you start with your players and, and what do they do well? How can I help put them in positions to be successful? And then when you're talking about him, he's played in our system now. You know, he's in his fifth year. He just has such command of what we're doing uh, um, where everybody else is on the floor. And, um, you know, he and I communicate a great bit, you know, uh, about everything. But he just he knows our stuff inside and out. And so, um, again, I, I really like what we do, but he just makes it makes it work at such an elite level. Nico, Coach Mack here, man, it's interesting that, uh, you know, a lot of times when you have a player of Isaiah's caliber, you know, they've, they've been really good as a junior, senior. He's been he's been daggone good for five years now. Are you going to try to get him a sixth year next year or what? Man, I tell you what, I, I just uh, sure make my life easier. Um, yeah, when he came back this year, uh, that was just really the icing on the on the cake. And it is, I tell you what, I mean, he's, I'll never forget this. You know, when he showed up on campus as a freshman, we were just starting, starting over here kind of, and you could tell he had an opportunity to be really, really good. But I, I had lunch with him in October before his freshman year. And I said, Zay, you know, you're going to be the starting point guard. And I intend it, you know, for to be that way the rest of your career. And I'll be dang, that's what it's been, you know? So it's been five mm-hmm. great years with this, uh, with this young man, he's kind of a unicorn uh, uh, that way. And, and uh, man, I tell you what, he's just a special young man and he's going to have a, an opportunity to play, you know, at the next level, but he's always wanted to coach. And I tell you what, he's going to be an unbelievable coach one day, a heck of a lot better than me. <laughs> Nico, you know, he, a lot he of was fans. On, he, oh, go ahead, Chris. Sorry. Yeah. Real, real quick, Nico, a lot of fans don't know they have the opportunity because of the time change sometimes to see some of the mountain West games and, you're obviously playing in an incredible environment tomorrow, uh, tomorrow night at Utah State. Maybe give the listeners or followers a little bit of idea of what you're facing in that environment tomorrow night. Yeah, I mean, you know, it'll be sold out like, you know, a lot of these arenas that, that we'll play in. Um, you know, you go back to, to when Stu Morrill was at Utah State and just built that thing into a juggernaut, and they've really never looked back. They've had a, a, a string of great coaches and great success, and Danny has just obviously taken that on again here in his first year. Um, they will say the students are on top of you. They will say some nasty stuff uh, uh, um, in, a, in a fun way. I love, I love playing uh, um, on the road in these environments. Maybe I'm, I'm crazy, but that's what it's all about. It what's, it's what makes college basketball so special. But, yeah, this is going to be – I mean, the pit's incredible. Viejas and Sandy, our, our place is awesome, man, when it's full. But the spectrum um, in Logan is as tough of a place as you'll, as you'll play. Yeah. Nico, we had Isaiah on here, I, you know, I, I must have been a month ago, and it was after a win with you guys and just interviewing him and, and talking to him. You know, in today's day and age in college basketball, you know, to get a guy to stay at one school when the norm is just to leave, and he hasn't. What were some of those conversations like just in the postseason with you and him when, you know, maybe – people are trying to get at him. And I'm sure they were trying to get at him because that's what everybody – and we've had, you know, Coach May from FAU and, and the same thing when you have the, those talented players or just some of those conversations like between the two of you guys and the reason that he's stayed and been committed to Colorado State. You know, I, I – and there's a lot of reasons for that. I think it wasn't just about the conversation in the off season. I think it's about – the continuous conversation you have with these young men during their whole time here and talking about the plan, his future. And I mean, the plan was always, I'll tell you an interesting story about Zay, you know, after his junior year, you know, I asked him if he was interested in, in, in testing and uh, he said, no. And I was kind of, boy, and he said, coach, I, I, I know I'm not, 
I'm not going to get drafted. I'm not going to play. I'm not ready yet. He goes, I don't even want to go through the rigmarole and have people tell me this. He goes, I just need to get to work. So I'm going to take a week off and I just want to stay here and get and get to work. And we talked about, well, after your, you know, your, your fourth year, your senior year, well, that's what we're going to do. And so I just tried to support him through that the whole time. It was, it was clear from, from day one, it was not, he was not going to entertain transferring. Uh, it was either going to be, you know, take a shot at the pros or come back to, to, to CSU. And um, so, you know, he, he's, gosh, I mean, he's, he is, he's, he's different that way. I think he realized he, we had a great relationship. He's got a great opportunity here. He believed the team could get back to winning like they had been uh, um, here. Um, he felt like he was in a position to be successful. He was getting better every day. Um, and so I think he could see the big picture and I'm just, I'm so happy for him individually, a young man that's believed in what we're doing, um, for him to come back in the fifth year and really have the season that he's having. And again, everybody's got their own journey and whatever, but it's great to see that somebody can do it that way <laughs> still and have yeah. a high level of success that just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it just because you can leave and you can transfer doesn't mean you should maybe some for somebody it is but in his case uh, um you know that was never entertained and he's got an unbelievable family and support system and uh pretty lucky as a coach to have a guy like that how nice was the bottle of champagne that you popped when you got the call that that said <laughs> hey coach i'm coming back to colorado state fifth year Man, I tell you what, you know, and, and we went through in the other way, you know, a few years ago, David Roddy, you know, had left to the you know, day before the deadline and same thing, you know, he was either going to go pro or come back. And obviously he made the, an unbelievable decision because he, you know, became a first rounder. But this time the, the, the luck kind of went our way and we got that call right there in, in, in May. And, and uh, I'm not a champagne guy, Rob, but I like my good red wine. So I'll tell you that. Uh, um, maybe that and, and it, it's in, in, in some good bourbon too. So that was a good, that was a good, uh, a good night for, for, for us. Yeah. It's funny. You say that the last time I saw you at the final four was uh that was more of a Coors light kind of a night that, uh, that we had <laughs> real quick before I let you go. I, yeah. I do just want to ask the, the mountain West, the top of the league, right. Is New Mexico is really good. San Diego state coming off of a trip to the national title game is very good. Obviously you guys are very good. Utah state is 13 and one. Nevada is 13 and one Boise state had, a, I think it was an eight and four start to the season, but we know how good uh, the, some of the pieces on the Tyson Degenhart, for example, are on that roster and UNLV, a team that no one's really talking about beat Creighton by 15 points already this year. How tough is this conference? How good is this conference? How much work are you going to have uh, cut out for you to try to go out and win this thing? I mean, you know, I'm sure every coach, whatever league we were in, Matt, when we were in the SoCon together, we talked every year about how great the league is. Everyone thinks their league is great. Our league's great. I mean, I've been fortunate to be in this league for a long time as an assistant and now the head coach. And the, the level of coaching, the level of investment uh, in these programs, again, a lot of people don't get to see these teams play every day. Uh, uh, there's pros, uh, um, unbelievable venues. Uh, the league is really good. And, and obviously the top of the league speaks for itself, but you know, you think it's going to be easy to, to beat San Jose state, you know, I mean, uh, uh, despite the coaching, well, Timmy, I do. Uh, the, the coaching uh, there, the coaching there is not, but, the best. but, uh, <laughs> but, but it, I mean, it's just, it's, it's great all the way around. And I, I fully expect, you know, the league's going to get four bids, maybe five, who knows, maybe more. I mean, that's just the way that it, that it looks right now. And so none of that surprises me. Again, you got guys that have done it for a long time, the schools that really invest in basketball. Um, you know, I've been saying this for a long time. I think the goal of our league, we need to become a big East version of the, of the West coast. And we just got to continue to grow and build our brand. And we've got to continue to have success in the NCAA tournament, like San Diego state did last year. Ultimately you've got to win in March, um, and I think we've got a lot of teams who maybe have the ability to do that. Yeah, it's a six bid Mountain West. That's what we're pushing for, Nico. You got to get on the bandwagon. Six bids for the Mountain West. Listen, uh, we're going to let you go. You're you're in the hotel in, Yo in Logan right now. You got Utah State on the road and Boise State on the road coming up. Good luck with that, man. We appreciate you uh, sharing some time with us. Here. <laughs> I'm going to need a bottle of bourbon. I'll tell you that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> hey, you guys, listen, man, I listen. What you guys do. We need both you guys back in coaching, man. So. <laughs> just wait till the end Appreciate of the season you, right man. Let start the show, man. We, they're yeah. on the schedule for another month that was nico medvick colorado <laughs> State head coach 
the other side of the break, when Thanks, we come guys. back, we're going to talk about Rick Pitino versus Dan Hurley and how to replace someone like Bryce Hopkins with an injury. What's going on, guys? Before we get back to the show, I need to let you all know about the Field of 68 Daily, an all-encompassing college basketball newsletter that arrives in your inbox, you guessed it, daily. For less than a dollar a week, you'll wake up every morning to more than 1,500 words detailing everything that you need to know to stay up to date on the world of college basketball. From the notable mid-major upsets to the stars that are out injured to the breakout performances that only our team of college basketball junkies watched. The Daily is edited and produced by Mike Miller, who spent more than two decades running NBC's digital written content and is subscribed by more than half of the Division One coaching staffs, the biggest names in college basketball media, and the agents that work as power brokers in the sport. For just $50 for the year, you get access to the same information that the insiders get. And before we get you back to your regularly scheduled Field of 68 content, let me tell you guys about the Field of 68 merch store. Head over to fieldof68.shop for officially branded Field of 68 apparel. Whether you're supporting your favorite team in the student section or from the couch, there is no better way to gear up than the latest from the Field of 68. The best thing I can say about our merch is the quality of the product. Anyone that has ever worn a t-shirt knows how frustrating it is when the neck gets all stretched out and the bottom of the shirt starts looking like the bottom of bell-bottom jeans. And there's nothing worse than a hoodie that loses its snugness that makes it such a perfect way to stay warm during the cold winter weather. Whether you're shopping for yourself or for the college basketball fan in your life, everything you need is at the field of 68.shop. Welcome back to the Thursday evening edition of the Field of 68 After Dark. My name is Rob Dosser. We got head coach Chris Mack. We got head coach Matt McCall. We just heard from head coach Nico Medved of the Colorado State Rams. It's always good to catch up with Nico. It's always uh, great to hear from him, and I'm a big fan of the Mountain West Conference this year. Um, I, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about uh, the Bryce Hopkins and, and Terrence Shannon stuff. And not specifically, you know, like, oh, Bryce Hopkins tore his ACL. Obviously, that's terrible, and, and we're thinking about him. I want to kind of hear you guys from the coaching perspective. Like, how are you – how do you handle that, right? If you have a guy that is such a big piece of what you do, like Terrence Shannon, for example, right? Um, first team All-American, averaging 22 points, such a big part of what they do in transition, defensively, offensively. Um, and now he's gone. How do you – how do you rebuild? How do you revamp? How do you change what you do? Mac, you, you mentioned earlier that you had Edmund Sumner tear his ACL in the middle of the season before. Like, how do you go about attacking that as a coach? Well, I think every situation, every injury uh, is a little bit different, Rob, in the sense that, you know, Edmund was our point guard. You know, I know Terrence tends to play with the ball a lot. Bryce Hopkins, not necessarily, but he was their sort of go-to guy. And, you know, I think that, um, you know, for a, a team like Providence, uh, it's a tough challenge. You know, they're, they're going to have to be able to pick up Bryce's rebounding. I, I think you never necessarily, like, just replace the guy and plug someone else in and, and you know, hope it becomes, you know, what it was before. Uh, I think, you know, you, you hear the term, you got to do it by committee. But I, I still think you have to be who you're going to be. Now, now, for us back in the day, if, if I, I remember Edmund went down, you know, he was our point guard. He was a dynamic one. He was a guy that could score 15, 20 points on any given night and uh, really electrified our team by getting out in transition and finding guys like Blewett and Makura uh, and get, got them open looks. And then all of a sudden we go to a guy like Quentin Gooden, who's a freshman at the time. And he was barely playing 10 minutes a game prior to that. He went from playing 10 minutes a game to about 38, 39 minutes a game. And we struggled for a bit. You know, we almost didn't make the tournament. And then we end up going to the Elite Eight. And Quentin was a guy that, you know, sort of became that quarterback that just sort of, you know, managed the game and, and sort of put the ball in other people's hands. He wasn't tr trying to play like Edmund. And I, I think for him, being a freshman, that, that, that was a huge deal for him to be able to just sort of run the team, not necessarily try to go above and beyond and, and try to get Edmonds number, numbers or play like him. And consequently, he got Trayvon and JP better shots. Now, having said that, you know, they got a lot of plays, set plays that they're going to Bryce Hopkins. So they're going to have to play through some different guys. They're going to have to pick up the slack on his, with his rebounding. I thought the way Illinois played the other night without Terrence was, uh, was impressive. 
I guess my only thing is, can they continue that? As again, you, you, very few teams can lose somebody that's averaging 22 points a game, a first team All American, and not miss a beat over the long term. So I, I'll be really interested to see, especially tomorrow when they play Purdue, you know, how Illinois looks um, when, again, time passes. Yeah. Go ahead, Matt. Yeah. I mean, I, I think dealing with an injury is kind of separate to to what Illinois is dealing with right I mean they're trying to figure out you know is he coming back I mean that's a whole separate you know category Uh, my first year at Chattanooga um, we had a guy named Casey Jones and when I got the job you could tell he was the alpha male and he was the guy and um, our first I mean our first game my first game as a head coach we went on the road and beat Georgia 92 to 90 in overtime Two games later, we beat Illinois on the road, and Casey Jones was leading us in points, rebounds, and assists. He was leading us basically in every single category. And the day before, we're supposed to go on the road and play Dayton in a warm-up drill, basically just a closeout drill. Uh, You know, someone that ball faked in a closeout drill, Casey left his feet and dislocated his ankle. And it was one of the most gruesome injuries that I've ever seen live. Um, And he was done for the year. Um, and we actually went on the road the next day and beat Dayton. And I don't think if we win that game, I think we still have a pretty good year because we had a lot of really good players. But that game kind of and his injury kind of rallied our group together. And there were other guys that stepped up as soon as he went down. And as a young head coach, because of how good he was, I would get caught up in just trying to run almost every single action at him and every single underneath out of bounds play and every every set or dead ball or timeout or whatever it was because he was that good. And when he went down, it seemed like the ball flowed and moved more and other guys like Coach Max has kind of stepped up and, and we were able to have a lot of success and they loved him. I'll never forget – That win against Dayton, all those players wanted to do was call Casey Jones, who was in the hospital dealing with his injury. And they kind of rallied around that. And and we went on a run and and went to the NCAA tournament. And, you know, every injury is different. Like Coach said, every, you know, Casey was this hybrid. We played him at the three. We played him at the four. You know, your point guard gets taken out. That's a different scenario you got to deal with, you know, but, you know, Kim English is a young head coach and, and trying to manage this situation too is, is a challenge. And for me, I had veteran players and was fortunate to have veteran players and guys really stepped up. Trey McLean, Chuck Esther became kind of our glue guy there. And, and Chuck the next year ended up having a season ending injury as our glue guy. It, it's a, it's a tough thing to try to manage, especially as a young head coach. Um, but having a veteran team really helps. Yeah, the the one thing I will say about Kim dealing with this is that his senior year in college was the year that Missouri went like 30 and 4 and won the Big 12 tournament and was a 2 seed. And before the season started, I think like days before the season started, Lawrence Bowers who was their all uh, I believe like their all conference four man tore his ACL. So Kim, I always make fun of him for this, ended up playing power forward that entire season for Missouri. So it's it's a matter of guys, I think, have to sacrifice and step into different roles. I think the thing that makes me so interested in what Illinois is going to be is that is exactly what you just said about how the ball moves a little bit more. Like Terrence Shannon's an All-American point guard has been unbelievable in transition, uh, has been shooting the ball a lot better this year. But it feels like when you watch Illinois the last two games, like it's kind of pinging around a little bit more, right? And obviously you don't want to lose an All-American, but I think that – uh, not knowing maybe what to expect for other coaches. How much does, does that help too, Mac? Like you just – some of these other guys don't know what you are going to do or what change you're going to make? Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, don't know. I, uh, go ahead, Matt. Go ahead. No, I, 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 don't, I don't know if Rob's saying Mac or Matt sometimes. So we, we <laughs> yeah. to, you know, I don't know. Maybe it's the audio down here in Long Island, New York. I don't know. Is it Mac <laughs> or Matt? Which one was it? I'm just going to start McCall. saying Chris. I'm going to say Chris from now on. So instead of Mac and McCall, it's going to be Chris and Matt. Okay, all right. Just say Mac. Go, go ahead, Coach Mac. <laughs> I don't even know what the hell the question was at this point. <laughs> <laughs> the, 
No, I'll, I'll, I'll chime oh, in. No, because I, I, dealt, I dealt with it because, <laughs> like I said, Casey Jones was, was leading us in every single statistical category, and we were winning games. We were winning games at – I mean, you don't – you know, at Chattanooga to beat, you know, two Power 5 schools in your first four games is – you know, it, that's big time. And Casey went down. And a lot of stuff that we were running offensively was through him. And the ball was in his hands. We'd play him at the power forward spot and reverse it through him and let him initiate offense and or call set plays to get him the ball in a lot of different spots on the floor, underneath that of bounds, whatever it was. And when he went down, it's like, okay, now, man, all right, let's let's more ball movement, more player movement, more passes per possession. And our offense really evolved. And you never want to lose a player like that. You never want to lose a player of his caliber at all. But to your point, Rob, you know, with Terrence Shannon being out, the ball's hopping around a little bit more. And, you know, Brad Underwood, you know, isn't having to figure out, man, we, we got to get him the ball in this spot because he's so good here. So let's run this action that, you know, every team is scouting. And now they, they're going to double him, whatever it may be. You know, it, it can hop around and teams aren't prepared for it, right? I mean, that, I'll never forget this. We lose Casey and Tom Ostrom is a dear friend of mine. He's an assistant coach at Dayton, and he calls me and says, is this for real? I'm like, Tom, we just lost our leading score, and you're calling me right now to ask me if he's not playing. He's not playing in the game tomorrow. But they're scouting for Casey Jones to play. And now he's not on the floor, and a lot of their game plan is to go at him. How are we going to defend him? Now you got to guard more movement, more player movement, more ball movement. You should have told him it was the wrong player. You should have told him it was somebody else that actually <laughs> hurt his knee or hurt his ankle instead of uh, instead of Casey. All right, uh, we got about two minutes left before we head to last call over on Stadium where we will be answering questions. I've already seen some of the questions that have shown up in the chat. And let me just say, uh, buckle up, boys, buckle up. McCall, who is your toast of the night tonight, Thursday night here in college basketball? I don't have a drink in front of me here, but um, I'm going Grand Canyon. Give me Ty and Grant Foster. Those guys are 13-1 and one right now. Coach Cruz doing an unbelievable job. They keep winning games. If you have not seen that team play, get on ESPN+, Plus, whatever network they're playing on, and watch them. They're fun to watch. Ray Harrison, one of the best guards in the league, toasting the Grand Canyon, another win tonight. I will toast to that. Chris, what do you got? I'm going to go with uh, Ben Johnson of the Golden Gophers, man. They they got a, a nice win against the Michigan Wolverines. I know there's been a lot of heat on Coach Johnson, so it's good to see the Golden Gophers come up victorious tonight. Here's to the Golden Gophers. Um, I am so glad that you guys picked those two because you left me with Andre Curbelo. Jeff Goodman's pick as first-team All-American in 2022 finally comes good. Curbelo tonight. Triple-double, 13 points, 10 boards, 11 assists. Southern Miss beat somebody. I don't even remember who it was. How about this? He shot five for 21 from the floor and put up a triple-double. That's got to be the first time that that's ever happened in the history of college basketball. So, Andre Corbello, cheers to you, sir. We know you're getting after it tonight just like we are. Uh, head over, Stadium, YouTube channel, the Stadium app. We are going to be going to last call for 30 minutes. Answering your questions, whatever you ask in the chat, we will ask on the show. Thank you.